All right, welcome back to the Sustainability Podcast. My name is Gavin, and I am joined today with Eli Beckton. Eli, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, Gavin. How are you? I'm doing good. Eli, I know we originally met at the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference, and I was really interested in your story, and we actually toured a microgrid system at the Florida International University, which is a really interesting experience. Um, Can you give a little bit of background about yourself and maybe how you found yourself at that conference? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm the mayor of Corte Madero, which is a small town uh, in California outside of San Francisco. Um, I'm a member of the Climate Mayors Group, which is just basically a group of uh, mayors nationwide um, who are climate hawks, who are really worried about, um, you know, focused on climate change as sort of the the top issue that our communities face. Mm -hmm. Um, So I found myself there. Uh, through the Climate Mayors Network, um, and then my day job is as uh, an architect in sustainable design. So uh, I was kind of there for for that aspect as well. Nice. I I get that too. I was there for school and work, so it was nice to kind of wear those two hats. Um, I I found the content really interesting, and anytime I'm able to go out and go to a conference, I really appreciate it because you always end up meeting really interesting people. Um, I'm really happy to have you on today. And I want to hear a little bit more about your day job. So what does that really entail? Sure thing. So what I do, um, I build what's called ADUs. I've got a company called House Plus. We build ADUs, um, which means accessory dwelling unit. It's a big thing in California. Um, It's essentially a backyard home. So it's it's a home that's built on a property that already has an existing home and they're you know typically small right they're capped at 1200 square feet under state law so it's basically a, a little second unit that you might build in your backyard mm-hmm. and say like rent out or put your you know your college age student your college age kids in or your like aging parents in or whatever awesome so how are you able to make a sustainable impact with ADUs uh, yeah, great questions. We've got California's kind of on the leading edge of the regulation in terms of the building industry. Um, so by law, most buildings that are built in California are already quite sustainable. We try and take that a step further by just going above and beyond. You know, one of the key things is insulation, right? So our units are mm-hmm. super well insulated, just means that the whole building is much more energy efficient than uh, your, your sort of typical construction would be. Um, we're all electric, obviously, so no fossil fuels in any of our buildings. You know, we use only energy efficient appliances and only water water efficient fixtures. So we're really just trying to, to minimize the footprint of these buildings. And the goal ultimately is to take this to a place where all of our ADUs are not just, uh, you know, not just like carbon neutral, but actually net carbon negative. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, off the bat, I'm thinking you could, that could it's an increased area where you could put solar panels on the roofs of these ADUs. And I know that might be small, but at least you get a little bit of extra surface area for solar panels. Do you think that um, when implementing these sustainability changes within ADUs, is there any opportunities or lessons that you've learned that can maybe make houses um, more sustainable? If like maybe you have an existing house or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So really all of the techniques that we're using to make our ADUs, um, you know, extra sustainable, those are all applicable to full, you know, full size primary residences or to like new construction to whatever. Right. And again, like it comes down to insulation. It comes down to having an energy efficient um, sort of exterior of your building for people with existing homes. That can mean adding additional insulation to your exterior walls and your roof, or it can mean replacing doors and windows that are maybe like leaky or single pane um, with mm-hmm. something a little more energy efficient. Electrifying your home is, an, is, is a great way to reduce your, you know, your, your home's carbon footprint, right? Replacing those appliances that are burning gas or fossil fuels uh, with electric appliances, especially heat pumps. Uh, heat pumps are super energy yeah. efficient. So a lot of the techniques that we use are totally applicable across really all construction. Okay, awesome. Just a side note here, I was talking with my friend a few weeks ago and I was talking about this episode and I was like, have you ever heard of an ADU? And he works for a PR company here in Florida and was like, oh, I know all about ADU. So it was really funny to me that in one week, I, I guess I now I know about ADUs and my friend was already on the bandwagon. So uh, it was really interesting to hear about that. I thought that was really funny. So now we know about your day job. I want to hear more about the town of Corte Madera. What sustainability and climate challenges is your town facing? Can you just um, talk a little bit about your town and maybe um, just some of the current things that you're working on as the mayor? 
Yeah, absolutely. So Cord Madera is kind of uniquely vulnerable to climate change in that our town is half in the flood zone, half in the fire zone, um, which isn't typical of, of most towns, right? Usually, mm-hmm. usually if, if a city is has a has a climate vulnerability, it's generally one or the other. Um, right. We've got both. Uh, this, you know, I campaigned for town council. I was first elected in 2018. I'm in my second term now. Um, I tell, you know, since then, I tell anybody who will listen, climate change is the only existential threat that Corte Madera faces. Um, and so to me, it's my top priority. It's always been my top priority. It's always going to be my top priority. Um, you know, I think to me, it's really about protecting the town and ensuring the, the longevity and the continued viability of Corte Madera as an incredible place to live. So what does that look like? Um, two kind of things. We're trying to address both the cause and the effect of climate change, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, climate change is a global issue and Corte Madera can't solve it alone, but mm-hmm. also we have to do our part at the local level. Every city has to do their part. Um, so one of the things that I pushed was we adopted a climate action plan, which is basically our, our roadmap to uh, reducing the town's carbon footprint, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, reducing our, our climate impact, right? Um, that's looking at how do we transition to renewable energy? How do we provide more EV chargers? How do we plant more trees in public spaces? So, so the climate action plan is really looking at uh, doing our, uh, you know, we can to address our part in the cause of climate change. Right. Uh, then the other side of the coin, right, is adaptation, which is addressing the effects of climate change. Mm-hmm. So we were the first county, uh, first city in Marin County, which I'm super proud of, to adopt a climate adaptation plan, which is basically mm-hmm. a long-term uh, blueprint for how we're going to protect Corte Madera from both flooding and wildfire. Right. Just a little backtrack. So how were you able, I guess I want to know what services did you have to search for and so you could develop these plans? Did you like hone in and like find some sustainability consulting support or was it, uh, can you just walk me through that process a little bit? Yeah, you're exactly right. So at, at the at the city council level, it's fairly high level, right? We give direction to staff and say, hey, we'd like to uh, produce a climate adaptation report or produce a climate action report. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, essentially staff goes then and, and does research, talks with potential consultants. Oftentimes they'll bid out a project. They'll come back and say, hey, um, you know, here's our proposal for, uh, you know, a, a consultant team. Here's our proposal for a budget. And then the town council deliberates um, and, and determines whether, you know, whether the consultant team and the budget and the, and the plan the plan to develop the plan <laughs> looks, looks good to us. <laughs> right. All right. Interesting. Thank you. So do you know of any, what are the current options that are, that you're looking forward to mitigate the flooding effects and, uh, and wild wildfire? So are you like speaking with community members? What solutions are out there? And I guess like, what's your part in all of this? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually in the middle right now of a very robust public engagement process, specifically around flood adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, I live in the, the bay side of Corte Madera. We, we kind of have the bay side and the hillside. The hillside is sort of the fire zone. The bay side is sort of the flood zone. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, by the way, one thing that I like to highlight for folks, because there can be a tendency, I think, for people, not just in Corte Madera, but everywhere to kind of fall into this sort of not an us versus them mindset, but a mindset of like, hey, I live in the flood zone. I'm not going to worry about fire. I don't really want my tax dollars going to uh, fire mitigation. I want my tax dollars going to flood protection. And people who live in the fire zone might sometimes say, well, hey, I'm up on this hillside, uh, you know, and yes, I'm surrounded by, uh, you know, flammable forest, but I'm not at risk of flooding. So I don't want my tax dollars going to uh, flood protection. And what I tell folks is, look, Corte Madera, especially because we're such a small city. If one of these, like when we have a bad flood, it's everybody's problem. If we have a, God forbid, a bad fire, it's everybody's problem. And to think that that fire is, is going to just magically stop when it hits the edge of the, Mm -hmm. of the high fire severity zone. That's not how firestorms work. Um, And and likewise flooding, right? You may live on the hillside, uh, but if we have horrible flooding in town and and the freeway is flooded, you're not going to be able to go anywhere. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both of these issues impact everyone in town. Um, And so, we're really trying to build consensus, uh, do, you know, really robust community engagement, reach out to folks and, uh, you know, through a process of public workshops, surveys, you know, all kinds of public discussions and really get people's uh, feedback on, you know, what do, what's your sense of the risk that your home faces? What's your sense of the risk that we have in this community? What are some ideas, you know, in terms of like things that we could do to address this? What would you like to see? Is there anything that you really wouldn't like to see? So we're in kind of this important phase right now of getting folks feedback before we start to kind of flush out, okay, what do we think our next step is? I mean, I think some of this stuff, some of this stuff is, is fairly common sense, right? Like if you've got, um, so, so in Bayside, Corte Madera, we have two issues. Sea level is rising 
and the neighborhoods are sinking because they were mm -hmm. built on bay fill. Um, right. So we've got basically the land and the sea coming towards each other. Um, you know, it, it's pretty clear that there's going to have to be at some point some sort of barrier to keep the bay out of uh, the neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, that presents its own issue, right, which is we also have tons of rainfall, like especially with climate change, right? Warmer air holds more moisture, which is why rainstorms are getting so much more intense. Mm -hmm. If you've got a neighborhood surrounded by a levee, and it dumps a bunch of rain, where's that water supposed to drain to? And if that happens, you know, coinciding with a, with like a high tide, for example, then it becomes much harder to pump that water out um, of the neighborhood. So it, it's a pretty complex issue uh, with regards to, to, you know, the flood discussion, but we're working with the, with the residents right now to try and figure out, hey, you know, what would you like to see us do? How would you like to see us invest our tax dollars uh, in order to best protect these neighborhoods? And, and right, like for a lot of these folks, Speaking for my family, for sure, mm -hmm. our home is our primary asset of value. That's you know kind of all we have, um, right. and so right, it, it's critical. It means everything to folks, and you don't mm -hmm. want to jeopardize people's assets and their livelihoods by not planning to protect them long term. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Because, like right off the bat, it seems to me that even just like the disparity between like I'm in the fire zone, they're in the flood zone, and I only care about the fires and I don't care about the flooding. I, I feel like that kind of speaks for a general consensus of just like the United States or just like policies within the United States. So it's interesting that you are feeling like that same pressure just on a, a singular community local level. And I think the only thing that you can do right now is engage with the community, understand what they think. And I'm sure I'm sure people have great ideas. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see what you come up with and what your community comes up with. So I'm really looking forward to uh, further de developments on that. And I think it's really important to uplift these stories because a lot of my world, I, I talk on the macroeconomic thing. So I can, I think about like industries and like countries and regions of the world, but it's really interesting to hear more about the community level of things because they're still facing very similar problems that macro uh, we're seeing at the same macro level. Right. So, and, and one other thing that I would point out on that is, you know, to your point, like Cord Madera is a small town. When we look at the total, like when we look at the total cost of like everything we'd like to do to protect our town from mm -hmm. flooding and from wildfire long term, we're talking tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you think about how many Cord Madera's are there in California or in the right. United States, you know, and all of that funding has to come from like a finite pot of, of money, which is part of why it's so important for us to get out ahead of the pack in yeah. developing our climate adaptation plan so that we can actually be ready and say, hey, we've got this blueprint, we've got this plan that we invested in putting together here. We've got shovel ready projects to protect mm -hmm. our town. Everyone else is still kind of figuring out their plan. Let's get some funding and let's let's start attacking these projects. Yeah, that's awesome. So on our call um, previously, a few weeks ago, you basically introduced me to the the technology of community choice aggregators. Can you explain what a community choice aggregator is and your role in uh, this technology, but also um, more of like a community level uh, for Corte Madeira and their access to these community choice aggregators? Yeah, absolutely. So a community choice aggregator or a CCA, uh, as we call it, although I'm going to try and keep the acronyms to a minimum here. Um, uh, a CCA is basically like a publicly owned power company that's an alternative for residents to whatever the local utility is, which that alone, that in and of itself is kind of a revolutionary thing, right? Because mm -hmm. before, like, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, you didn't have an option of where you could buy your energy from. You bought your energy from whoever the local utility is, and you did not have a choice. And when it came to what the like what the actual attributes of the energy you were buying was, is it sustainable? Is it dirty? Is it cheap? Is it expensive? Like you didn't have any choice. So the advent of CCAs has really kind of been a game changer, right? Because now suddenly residents have this choice, and they can say, "I can stick with, for example, where we where we are. The utility is PG&E. They can say, "Hey, I can stick with PG&E." which is fairly expensive and PG&E's grid mix is I think something like 39% renewable or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or I can go with MCE, which is our local community choice aggregator. Um, you know, I can go with the local, the local clean power company. I can get power that's a little bit cheaper than PG&E and 100% renewable. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of like the the revolutionary power of that of CCAs that we're seeing is they're giving folks this act this this like decision point where suddenly you can say I don't need to be bound to the utility and whatever they're selling me. I don't need to just take what they're giving. I can mm-hmm. actually be an empowered consumer, make a choice. It's the right move for the environment. It's the right move for my for my personal finances. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. How do you? Uh, I think the interesting part here is. A lot of this always comes down to your energy bill at the end of the month. So how do you, uh, can you explain maybe how CCAs can become price competitive with um, more of like these larger utilities? Like how did that process work? What are the some of the contributing factors to reducing the price of renewable energy? Yeah, well, so here's a big part of it fundamentally of why CCAs make sense for, for consumers mm-hmm. is PG&E or, or other like local utilities are what we call investor owned utilities where mm-hmm. they, they're kind of, you know, in a lot of ways, just like any other company, their primary mission at the end of the day is to make money for their shareholders and for mm-hmm. their, you know, for their investors and for their executives. Yeah. Um, a CCA is totally different because it is a publicly owned company. It's, it's a public agency, basically. So it does mm-hmm. not have any profit motive. Um, right. The only people that CCAs are accountable to is the customers. Uh, and that is like a total paradigm shift. Even all, say all other things being equal, which of course they're not, the energy industry is incredibly complex, but even if you were to say all other things being equal, your CCAs are delivering power at what it costs to deliver power, your utilities are delivering power at what it costs to deliver power, plus their 20% profit margin or whatever. Right. Um, you know, so, so that right there, just fundamentally, it's a whole different ball game in terms of the economics for consumers. Interesting. That's awesome. Okay, so let's go a little bit um, more into renewable energy. I, I really want to talk about this because I think I actually just finished the energy regulation roundup for April 2024 and actually included California. Uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of this, but the, the uh, CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, just agreed upon um, some rules for allowing uh, basically solar energy and renewable energy batteries onto the grid and they it took about four years for them to come to this agreement and basically they're going to be allowing solar en- energy to be inputted onto the grid on a certain schedule where they are allowing them a certain amount of energy to be inputted onto the grid at like certain times of the day instead of it because solar energy is intermittent which is why utilities are kind of uh, not in favor of solar energy at all times. So they're trying to basically alleviate some of these um, challenges against solar energy. Have you heard about this regulation in California? And I guess I just want to talk about on a a bigger scale why these transmission issues are a problem in the state of California, but also abroad, just in general terms, speaking about renewable energy. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those are all great points. So I think with regards to your point about solar, uh, obviously just inherent to the nature of solar is you get a bunch of it at you know peak sunshine hours, and you don't get any of it at night. Um, mm-hmm. And so the question is, what do we do to make sure that we have a more like consistent supply of power throughout the day? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the answer is twofold. One, it's diversifying your energy sources. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, including things like wind uh, that are generating even at night and then two storage batteries. So that's key to be able to generate when you've got the resources and then be able to store it and dispatch it onto the grid uh, when you need it um, and when you're when you're not able to generate. Um, mm-hmm. So so that kind of speaks to like the nature of um, finding that that balancing point between all of the different resources at our disposal, all the different generating technologies, all of the different um, you know storage technologies. Uh, and it gets into a whole nother world of like, there's a, there's a step further you can take it where uh, you can do what's called a virtual power plant, which is actually right. something that we're piloting um, at our local uh, CCA, which I'm super excited about. Um, so I actually chair the the virtual power plant subcommittee um, at the board of, of our CCA. I didn't mention this, but I represent Corte Madera on the board of our local CCA. Okay. So that's how I get to be involved um, in a lot of this local energy policy. Um, but what we're doing is we're piloting what's called a virtual power plant, which is basically taking all of the, like all of the grid connected, uh, like smart appliances, both generation technology and uh, and like things that use energy. So mm-hmm. like with generation, it's like people's solar panels. I think that's like the primary one, right? Is is, is 
disparate solar panels on individual buildings, rooftops, um, taking all of those, taking everything that's using energy. So that's like everyone's water heater, everyone's furnace, um, you know, everyone's like little nest, like smart thermostat, um, mm -hmm. taking all of these different technologies and making them all sort of like talk to each other and work together in a synchronized way so that you can be uh, really like at a very sort of fine tuning level, matching your generation um, to basically matching your supply to your demand, right? So right. you can say like, oh, hey, it's a really hot day. Um, and we've got like a bunch of thermostats that are set to like, uh, you know, 80 degrees when they don't need to be, if we can like bring those down, or if we can say, hey, it's, it's um, you know, we're, we're a little low on energy. Let's bring like this handful of solar panels like spread across the city. Let's bring this handful of solar panels online. Uh, mm -hmm. It gives you like a, a sort of a next level ability to really, uh, again, like match that supply to the demand. Right. Yeah, that was interesting. That was a piece of it that was in in, included in the blog that I wrote, specifically in the article about this regulation in the state of, state of California, it included um, the use of solar inverters and basically limiting or just controlling the amount of energy flowing onto the grid, which is the uh, obviously the biggest uh, piece of this is just like the real the reliability of solar energy and making sure they're not like blowing up people's boxes inside of their homes, but also supplying them enough energy so they're able to become, obviously, be comfortable and keep their homes cooled. All right, so let's move on to more fun topics such as the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference in Miami Beach. What did you think of the conference? Let's just start there. Thorns? I thought houses. it was fantastic. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> um, definitely, uh, definitely more roses and thorns. I thought it was really fantastic. I had never been to... Uh, a conference like that before. Right. Um, and so it was just like really inspiring and kind of activating to be surrounded by people who are tuned into climate issues and people who are, are kind of at the forefront of climate action from like all walks of life, from all across the country and the world, from all industries. Um, mm -hmm. So that I found just like really inspiring and empowering, right, is to be able to sort of cross pollinate ideas with these folks um, and hear about what they're working on, right? Um, I, I remember like on the on the tour that we were on, I, I, I ended up talking with, um, I think it was like an insurance industry um, executive. And we ended up having a really good conversation about, right, um, you know, hey, what like, where's the insurance industry headed, especially in this era of climate change, like we're seeing in California, mm -hmm. we've got a huge problem with homeowners being dropped from their insurance policies, especially in the right. fire zone. I'm worried it's going to start happening in the flood zone as sea level advances. And so my sense is like, my sense has been kind of, hey, it's clear that the insurance industry, like the old business model is not working and we need to figure out a new way to insure people's homes. Um, and it was, you know, to have access to like folks from the insurance industry at this climate conference who are there to, to you know, learn themselves and be able to sort of cross pollinate like that um, was super helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's the best part of a conferences, honestly, and it's definitely helped me to I can be a little nervous like especially just like going to these conferences I work remote it's hard I get nervous but it's always really nice to finally just, just like speak up and talk to somebody and then you realize that they work with this amazing organization that you've always wanted to like get in contact with or something so I, that's like my favorite favorite part about going to climate conferences and I definitely um, suggest anybody that's watching find your New York climate conference. I highly suggest going to New York City Climate Week. That's obviously on the East Coast, but a lot of um, Green Biz, they host a lot of events actually like all across the country. So definitely follow up with Green Biz. I've always wanted to go to one of their conferences, but not have not been able to go yet. But at your uh, during your experience at um, Aspen Ideas Climate Week, you were involved with the Climate Focus Mayor's organization. Can you explain a little bit about that uh, group and uh, what happened at the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference? And just, um, yeah, just give us a little background on that. Absolutely. So our Climate Mayor's Summit uh, happened kind of on the sidelines of uh, Aspen Ideas. And basically what it was, just like Aspen Ideas, it was kind of just an opportunity for uh, climate focused mayors from across the country to get together and really just share ideas. Um, you know, what's working, what's not working, what challenges are we facing? Um, and it was, it was a fantastic experience. So, so we, you know, we had like panel talks, you know, we heard about basically what, what different cities and different leaders are doing to address their climate vulnerabilities uh, in a diverse array of cities across mm -hmm. the country. Um, it was fascinating to hear like parallels in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect them. Um, mm -hmm. so like, for example, us here in Corte Madera, we're on the San Francisco Bay. 
um, you know, right off the Pacific Ocean. California is is now just like the Northeast, really starting to look seriously at offshore wind, which is super yeah. exciting. And we're at the very early stages of trying to figure out, okay, what does that look like? What does building an offshore wind industry entail? Mm-hmm. Like where, where are these uh, turbines going to go? Where are they going to be built? Where, like, where are the ports that do we have ports that are capable <laughs> of, of like sending these uh, turbines out to sea on specialized ships? So all of these questions and who am I sitting next to at the climate mayor's conference, uh, but the mayor of, uh, I want to say it was, I believe it was uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, if I'm remembering the city correctly. It's the main port that's supporting the Vineyard Wind uh, offshore wind project, which was right. like, I think Vineyard Wind was like maybe the first utility scale offshore wind mm-hmm. um, in the United States. So so definitely a, an important kind of a groundbreaking project. And to be able to get uh, this mayor's perspective uh, in terms of like, what did that look like? Um, you know, they had to, I think, do a bunch of renovations to their port in, in New mm-hmm. Bedford. Now I'm hoping it was New Bedford. I'm like worried I, I could be misremembering the name. Massachusetts. Of the city. <laughs> yeah. I, um, uh, that, but that, it was it was just it was it was super fascinating to be able to talk to to him and hear about you know what did you have to do to renovate your port to make this happen? Mm-hmm. How did you get federal dollars to renovate your port? How did you put all the you know how did you like piece all the players together? Right. Or to the extent that it was being coordinated by like you know maybe the federal government or something like where did you fit in and how were you brought in um to that whole equation so right across the san francisco bay from us is the city of richmond all of us you know cities and and mayors around around the bay area um you know we know each other we work together it's a very like close collaborative community of of local leaders and so i've spoken with the mayor of richmond um about his interest in repurposing richmond's old world war ii era ports um Mm -hmm. into you know modern ports that could support uh, you know, a uh, California offshore wind industry. So it was just great to be able to hear uh, from the mayor of New Bedford about his experience and be able to take that that knowledge and that information home and share it with my friends in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, you know, I think that was kind of emblematic of, of what a cool experience it was to get perspectives and get insight from, from mayors across the country that I would have otherwise never had the opportunity to hear. Yeah, that's awesome. Right off the bat, I want to ask, uh, did you see, like, what was the experience level of these mayors and I'm, let me explain this question just a little bit more did you see like there was like a lot of younger mayors was there a lot of just more experienced mayors is there mayors like interested in climate who have are, like already been a mayor for a, a while like did you were you able to just like kind of see the group setting and I think it would just be so interesting for like young mayors to be speaking with more experienced mayors and hearing about like their journeys coming together meeting at like climate right Right. No, it was super interesting. And and I was impressed by the number of like, I felt like there was a good diversity in terms of like, uh, like age, in terms of like socioeconomic, in terms of like ethnic background. I felt like mm-hmm. there was a really impressive diversity of, of mayors represented at this conference, which was awesome to see. Um, very heartening. Um, you know, it makes you feel like we're moving in a, in a good, like more representative direction uh, compared to like where we've been historically, which is really nice. I think one like kind of funny paradox is that so I'm in my sixth year on the Corte Madera Town Council. I'm in my second term as mayor now. Um, I'm 31, so I'm pretty young as as far as mayors go. Um, mm-hmm. And so to be at this conference, right, with with um, you know, for example, new mayors who might be you know in their 50s or 60s or 70s. Um, right. So it was it was just interesting, you know, and it it, it helps you uh, it helps kind of put in perspective that like there are so many people from all different kind of backgrounds and all different stories um, getting involved in public service, which is really awesome to see. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that, I think that's a common theme, especially within sustainability, just because sustainability is a new term and just like a new like industry. So even just at, with ARC, we are, you can just see kind of just As an organization, we're all learning. And I would say that I was one of the more employees with ARC that was just focused on sustainability. And so it's been a really interesting experience, just kind of like spreading the wealth, but also learning from other people within the organization to just learn about. I feel like it's going to be like tit for tat. Like I'm teaching them stuff, they're teaching me things. So it's been, I think that's the cool part about sustainability is we're able to really um, like pick out specific experiences because they all kind of apply to this one area because it's kind of all hands on deck situation. 
Anyways, um, um, we are at our tail end of questions here. Thank you so much, Eli. Do you have anything last to say? Is there any, could we follow you on like a website or keeping up with uh, the Corte, uh, Corte Madera developments within sustainability? How can we keep up with you? Um, I think probably the best way I, I post the most updates on uh, my official Facebook page. So it's mm -hmm. Mayor Eli Beckman on Facebook. That's where I like to put updates on, you know, kind of what we're working on sustainability wise uh, in Corte Madera. It, you know, I, I, I would love to uh, love to follow you as well uh, and, and continue the conversation. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much, Eli. I hope you have a great day and thank you so much for joining us on the sustainability podcast.